There's a book that came out recently what, that promotes what might be called slacker Buddhism. The idea being that life is suffering, everything is impermanent, therefore there's, there's no point in trying. And we suffer because we try to be happy. But if we just stop trying, then everything would be fine. You can understand this kind of teaching as a corruption of the Dharma that happens when people try to sell it. People like to sell things that are popular. And there are plenty of slackers out there that would like to hear that the Buddha was on their side. But the problem is that this line of thinking doesn't start just with the people who are selling books on Buddhism. I was reading a monk who was trained in one of the branches of the forest tradition the other day saying that you have to realize that suffering is no big problem. Once you realize it's no big problem, then you're okay with it. When you compare this with what the Buddha had to say and what the Buddha's quest was, we're talking about it today, the kind of person the Buddha was, who even though he had no guarantee that he was going to be able to find the deathless, was willing to give up everything for the sake of the deathless. He kept running into disappointments. He tried to find teachers who could teach the way he was disappointed in the teachers. He practiced austerities. The austerities were disappointment. But he never gave up. He kept asking himself, maybe there's another way. And as he said, the secret to his awakening was two qualities, or consisted of two qualities. One was discontent with skillful qualities. In other words, he wasn't contented with the state of his mind until it actually attained the deathless. Anything else that was short of that, he would look for something more. He never told himself, well, maybe this is as good as it gets. I might as well give up at this point. That was not his line of thinking at all. If what I have is not the deathless, I want something better. That was his attitude. And then the second one was relentless effort. He was willing to, as he said, let his body dry up until it was just bones and skin, everything all desiccated, if, if that was when it was going to be required to find awakening. This is, I call him the anti-slacker. So how did slacker Buddhism get started? It can be traced back to a tendency that you find in the commentary, where they say, what is the Buddhist categorical teaching? the teaching that's true across the board, and they identify the three characteristics. Now, one, the Buddha never caught them as just characteristics. He taught them as perceptions. And two, he never stated that they were categorical. The only categorical teachings he had were, one, skillful qualities should be developed and unskillful ones should be abandoned, and two, the Four Noble Truths, which carried duties as well. Try to comprehend suffering or stress, abandon the cause, realize cessation, and develop a path. These are all truths with shoulds. These are all truths with duties. And it's within those duties that the Buddha taught the three perceptions. Because comprehending Stress means that you have to develop this passion for it. It sounds strange that we'd have passion for stress and suffering, but we do. We cling to these things. Where there's clinging, there's going to be stress and suffering. And the quality of passion is there in the clinging. So if you really want to understand it, you have to see wherever you're suffering that you're holding on to something. You're feeding off something. So you have to develop this passion for it. If you're going to get past it, then the cause of suffering or the origination of suffering, you have to de develop this passion for that as well. As for the third noble truth, that is dispassion towards craving. So you 
I try to apply the three characteristics as a way of developing dispassion for these things. With a path, however, you have to have a passion for the path in order for it to develop. Which means you don't apply the three characteristics to everything. You hold back on your practice of virtue, concentration, and discernment. What that means is that you don't apply the three characteristics to that, the path yet. You apply it to everything else that would pull you away. In terms of virtue, if you find that your attachment to your relatives or your wealth or your health would prevent you from observing the precepts, you've got to let go of that attachment. So you apply the three characteristics to that, the three perceptions to your wealth or your relatives or your health. In terms of concentration, anything that comes up in the mind that's going to pull you away from your object is fair game for applying the three perceptions. Then discernment itself. Every way of thinking that's not in line with discernment, you've got to develop dispassion for that. And only then, when all these factors of the path have done their work, then you turn the three perceptions on them as well. And then you're free. So what this means is the Buddha didn't start with the three characteristics. In fact, when he talks about his awakening experience, he never mentions them. He always talks about Four Noble Truths, Four Noble Truths, Dependent Core Rising, which is an extension of the Four Noble Truths. This, that, conditionality, which is the basic principle underlying the Four Noble Truths, causal practice, causal principles. So the Four Noble Truths, as he said, is the framework. The image in the canon is that it's like the elephant's footprint that contains the footprints of all the other animals. All the other teachings are, are contained in the Four Noble Truths. And so the three perceptions find their, their duties and their function within the context of the duties of the Four Noble Truths. Once you've got that point clear, then you realize suffering is a big problem. That's why the Buddha focused all, his, all of his teaching on solving that problem. If it were no big deal, that's what the first noble truth would be. Suffering is no big deal. But that's not the truth. Suffering is aging, illness, and death. That's sorrow, lamentation, despair. All of these things are a big deal. And what kind of use would there be in a teaching that said suffering is not a problem? I mean, you think for people who are not suffering that much, might be okay. But a lot of people in the world are suffering really horribly, and that teaching would be totally useless. In fact, it would be worse than useless. It would be harmful. So here we are in a relatively comfortable place, with relative comfort in our practice. So we can't let ourselves be slackers. We have to realize there's work that has to be done. But things are not always going to be this easy. The world could change. Your body's going to change for sure. And you have to take a lesson from the Buddha. Relentless effort, discontent with the skillful qualities. What this means is, as the practice goes along, you'll find that you'll have your ups and downs. The times when it's encouraging and your th enthusiasm seems to be getting lots of results, and then it's not getting results so much anymore, and you begin to fall away. And you've got to find the reserves within yourself to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and keep going again. And that's how the Buddha gained awakening. As he said, awakening is realizing the unyet as yet unrealized, attaining the un as yet unattained. In other words, it's something you've never experienced before. It's going to require doing things you've never done before. And a large part of that is learning how to develop a sustaining enthusiasm or sustaining conviction. So 
so that when things go really well, you don't get complacent. And when things get discouraging, you don't let yourself get discouraged. In particular, watch out for people who say, well, there's nothing to attain. Or just learn how to be accepting of everything, and be okay with everything. That's where they laid a lot of people in the path. You've got to realize that your suffering is a genuine problem. And you've got to take it seriously, not in the sense of being grim, but in the sense of its importance. So when things do go well in the mind, you don't get careless about your concentration. You're sitting here and the concentration is going really well. Then when the time comes to end, you don't just sit, toss it off for the evening. Say, I'll pick it up tomorrow morning at 5.30. You're trying to carry it with you as much as you can back to the place where you're resting. And meditate some more. See if you can recapture that if you lose it. And once you've got it, try to do your best to maintain it. And John Lee's image is having a really good piece of food and doing everything you can to make sure no flies land on it and nothing else gets it, nothing spoils it. The Buddha's image is of the, the man with a bowl of oil on his head, walking between a crowd on the one side and a beauty queen on another side. And behind him, there was a man with his sword raised, ready to cut off his head if he spills a drop of oil. You have to be that meticulous and that attentive to your concentration. Because it is your path out of suffering. And even in the relative comfort we have here, when you actually gain a taste of the deathless, you realize that basic sensory experience is extremely painful compared to what the deathless is. So even the pleasures we have here have pain built into them. And we use those three characteristics to remind ourselves of that. so that we don't get complacent and say, well, what I've got is good enough as it is. You look around, there's, it's unstable, whatever well-being you have that's short of the deathless. And because it's unstable, it's going to be a cause for suffering, and why identify with it? There must be something better. That's the discontent with skillful qualities. So our teacher was an anti-slacker, or what you may call an unslacker. And so we want to do well on the path, we have to be anti-slackers and unslackers as well. Because our suffering is our problem. No matter how much someone else may tell us, it's no big deal. We know for ourselves that it is a problem, and no one else can cure it for us. So take your suffering seriously. Take the potential to not suffer seriously as well. And don't let the slackers pull you astray. <laughs>